Right now, I'm going to hand over to our guest speaker, just to set the tone for us. And I always feel it's nice to hear from somebody out there that, that's been involved in, in something that requires teamwork. Um, our guest speaker is a gentleman by the name of Razik Raja. And um, I recently met him. I'm not going to go in how we met. But um, he created something very unique in South Africa. Okay? I'm going to give you an opportunity just to pop outside after he's spoken. But he's created a proudly South African supercar. And outside is the car standing there. Um, for those of you that are not so into cars, internationally this vehicle is, is quite popular. They've put a unique body, car, body kit on it. And it's quite an expensive item. And Razik came up with the idea and said, why can't we do something like this in South Africa? Make it proudly South Africa at a fraction of the cost. And he had this vision to which he um, had a goal and he met that goal by creating a proudly South African supercar. But like you know, with everything that we do, it requires teamwork. And so I'm not going to give too much away from his talk, but I've invited him to come and share with us what he did and what principles he used with regards to putting a team together to create this unique proudly South African version of a GTR. So please give a warm welcome to Mr. Razik Raja. Excuse my voice, I'm a, I have a little bit of the flu that still has a bit of traits in my system. As you heard, my name is Razik Raja, I'm from Good Hope Construction. It's, I'm really proud to st stand here today because I actually qualified at the University of Western Cape. I started out at Stellenbosch in the dental and medical field. I jumped ship in my third year and uh, I felt it wasn't for me. And uh, I then went and studied something in finance. A lot of people thought maybe I'm a little bit crazy, but I always felt, you know what, in life, uh, do what you like. Because if you like what you do, you can end up loving what you do. I'd first like to take the opportunity to thank Gerard Phillips for inviting me here today to address the respected audience I find myself in front of. Gerard and I met under very different circumstances than, than what we find ourselves surrounded by today. When thinking of a topic on what to talk about today, uh, Gerard said to me he, think it would, he thought it would be apt to relay a story to you that was a dream that ended up becoming a reality. And considering that this workshop deals with teamwork, and leadership and conflict resolution. Um, he said to me, he would love for me to come out and relay the story to you guys. But before I relay the, raise the story, I must begin by saying, success doesn't happen by accident. Even the guy that wins the lotto actually makes the effort to go out and buy the lotto ticket. In my personal opinion, from the success, most successful people I've met in my life to date. I must relate to you the traits that I believe that they, that they do possess. Number one is you've got to be able to trust in yourself and your judgment. In other words, if you expect the world out there to believe you, you've got to be the first one to actually be able to have the confidence in what you say. Secondly is, whatever you do, do it 100%. Anything less than that effort, you should actually ask yourself, why are you doing it in the first place? If you do things you like, it makes all the difference. Number three, don't be scared to fail. Failure should not bring you down. It should actually 
inspire you to try harder. Number four, being a leader is more important than being a winner. You might not understand what I mean by that. But unfortunately in life, no one person is an island. It doesn't matter how clever I think I am or even what I am. I'm going to need people around me to assist me to make something successful. And that's the reason why I say being a leader is more important. Because leaders create winners. Number five, being humble. Your success in life can be amplified either by hatred or joy. The more humble and kind you are, results in the people around you either admiring you or despising you. My last break for a successful person is how do you measure success? I prefer to measure success not by the possessions you have, but rather by the relationships friendships that you create and what people say about you when you're not there. It's impossible to have everybody around you like you. But it's not impossible for everybody around you to respect you. On that note, I'd like to get back to the Razor story and I hope that I in some other way inspire you to, to do your own Razor Bowl one day. I was at a plumbing conference overseas and a friend of mine gave me a call. You know, Ras Marin is a fellow drift athlete. And he said to me, Razik, um, would you like to join me on, on a build? And I said to him, on a build on what? He said to me, a build on a car. I said to him, what car? And he said to me, it's a Nissan GTR R35. And I said to him, well, you know what? We might be sitting in different quarters of the world at the moment, but our wavelengths are on the same path, because I've actually acquired a GTR 35, and that's my actual intention. So getting back to South Africa, I had to put a team together to do something that none of us had ever done, and that was to rival the world stage with a car built second to none. I decided the key factor in choosing a team would be no other trait than passion. Because I knew it would require long hours to redefine a car that hundreds of engineers and architects worked on to create. That was going to be no easy task. I increased the stakes by saying I want something to be proudly South African only South African products. And that means no overseas help. So, to buy things from overseas that have a template, it's quite easy, you see it, I like it, buy it, bring it in, slap it on, fantastic, it looks beautiful. And that's not what I wanted. So then, coming back to your workshop today, I had to surround myself with a team of individuals who I didn't really know. And I think that's sometimes the leap that one's got to take in life. So to assign the roles of the, of the like-minded individuals that I chose to embark on this journey, I was Niaz Daniels from Exmods. He was our fabricator, the guy doing the body kit. We had Craig Shazank from Shazank Motorsport. He was the machinist dealing with the engine work. He was a friend of mine, Noor Asmadeen, who is an IT architect and a fellow drift athlete. He was there on the design side. It was Yasin Parker from Dent Expert. He came in on the uh, painting side and we looked at him as the artist. And then I had Zach Abrams and uh, Garen Tuck and they dealt with on the graphic sides. The final role play in the team was my wife play the role of the boss. You know, they say women can have a good go with each other. Let me give you some advice. Racing drivers and car enthusiasts are more sensitive. 
Well, I'd like to start off by showing you what a standard GTR 35 looks like. If uh, you could take a look at the screen for those that are, that's, that's a standard looking R35. And um, we then had to go to a modeling shop to take this car to make it look better than, than what a designer in Italy, you can stop at that point, you're not. A designer in Italy, not in Italy, in Japan decided what to do. It takes a bit of courage to decide to cut up something. Because when you have no template of what you're ultimately going to create, that becomes a little bit scary. It took me about a year to decide, listen, I'm going to go and buy something and cut it up. And hopefully what, I, what we build as a team, firstly I'm going to like, let alone the world out there. And everybody that I knew, including my immediate family and the guys from Guru Construction Racing, um, everybody thought this is like crazy. There's something wrong with him because South Africa has seen your guys in Supercar League buy a car, but you buy a template from overseas. And this was genuinely one of the first documented, widely publicized builds. South Africa has built supercars, um, but we haven't done them, we've documented them well enough. So, Jerry, if you can just take us back to those slides. Next one. So as you can see, there's no fenders. Um, the bonnet was off. That was the carbon fiber bonnet. On the next slide, what you'll notice is that's where we actually cut the car. So we've cut the arches to make way and room for, for the body kit that we intended to put on. On the next slide, you'll see the only thing that was left on the car after we cut it up was actually the side doors, the roof, and the posts. I can tell you I had a heart attack when I looked at it and I thought to myself, what did I just start? On the next slide you'll see that's when the car starts taking some level of shape. I'm not sure if there's another pick. That's when it gets into a spray booth and that was done at Dent Expert. And before we jump to the next slide, What happens then is that I said to myself, you're going to have, you, you want to create a crazy looking version of R35. You've also got to have the engine works within that. And I gave a friend of mine, Otto Graven, a course, one of South Africa's most acclaimed drifters. And I said to Otto, Otto, I'll I'm building this insane looking car, it can't only be looking insane from the outside, I've got to make it look insane from the inside as well. From there I met with Craig Shazank, we spent quite a few hours on the phone deciding how fast do we go, daily runner, track car, and I said to him, we're going to go with the daily runner. I said, I want to create a daily runner insane car to rival all supercars, supercar brands out there. We managed to build a thousand horsepower GTR that goes 0 to 100 in under 3 seconds. So now we had the car done. Now we had to dress this car. And sometimes creating beauty. You can have a beautiful male or female. And I think if, they've not, if they don't present themselves in the correct manner, you lose the plot. And we say to ourselves, we are these sort of nobodies from the bottom tip of Africa and we want to go and rival the world stage. And that's when we paused and we said, how do we do this? And you know, sometimes in life what happens is we all feel we know it all. At some other point, you know what I mean? We accept that, we mildly accept we don't know it all, but it's good to believe you know it all. 
But when you're in a team, I think what's important is to understand not every idea of yours is made in heaven. And sometimes it's difficult to accept. Because we have this notion of can he be cleverer than me? Can he know better than me? And then we look at color, we look at creed, and we look at all sorts of things. And then by the end of it, what happens is we actually do a defined injustice to ourselves. As I stated earlier, the one thing you realize when you enter into the working environment or you enter into the unprotected environment of family, home, varsity, you realize that you need to be able to be a team player. The most successful people I know are not the most cleverest. They're the most confident. They're the type of people, as I said to a staff member of ours the other day, I said to him, when I qualified from varsity, I said to myself, what's the one trait that I need to, to desire to obtain? And that is, I said to myself, and that is to get my enemy to be able to converse with me. Because if you can get somebody that doesn't like you, and that doesn't want to know you, to be able to work with you, then you've achieved and attained a level of success that very few out there are able to attain. Sometimes we bring our prejudice or our own viewpoint into such an extent into our business or our personal life that we actually are the own cause of why we don't progress further in life. So coming back to the razor story, I had a picture of how I wanted the car to look because I felt I'm the owner. I should say how it looks. And then I sat back and I said to myself, uh, I'm going against the grain of what I believe in. And that's when I sat down with a mate of mine. And he gave me an idea which expanded and broadened and we redesigned it. And at the end of it, I'd like, Gerard, if you could go to com completed fo photos. And from that horrible looking, odd looking car you saw in a, in a workshop, we created Razer GTR. You can go to the next slide, Gerard. Why we look for some cranes in Cape Town is because I am part of a company called Good Hope Construction. On the next slide. Next one. That's myself and Gerard. We, we met through Razor GTR. And what had happened was I, I was quite elated when I said, okay, fine, you know what? We, I feel we've done something unique. And I put this onto Facebook. And I thought I said it might generate some interest because there are a lot of GTR kids out there in the world. I was lost for words when we hit 10,000 in the first two hours. I thought, this is that brilliant. I was happy with 10,000. I said, listen, I'm, I'm overjoyed. I went to 20,000, 30,000, 40, 50. Next day it was 100,000. Following day it was 200,000. When it reached over half a million, I sat literally in awe and I said, listen, I didn't know this was going to be going this viral and this insane. Considering the fact that there are kids out there. But what I found that the outside world looked at is sometimes what happens is you get classed. Being in Africa, being in South Africa, somebody assumes just by nature of association and by economies of scale, us being a third world country, 
that we actually have a third world ability. And I think that's what Gerard is driving at. That workshops like these change your perception. That the only time, because sometimes you, you find a flock of sheep, and this is how things always have been, and you continue doing it like that. Because you feel that if I'm going to step out of the box, or I'm going to step out of this comfort zone, um, is it worth the risk? It's worth the risk and more. So that interest on social media, said to me, listen, I think we, we're onto something. My initial statement when I started to build this car was I saw the, the eyes in my 10-year-old son light up. And I completed the build and I took that extra effort and time in it because he was my greatest fan. And I said to him, he asked me, Dad, why are you building this car? I said to him, the one is to showcase what South Africans can do and what we can do with teamwork. And the second thing is, I'd like a custom car magazine to call me and say to me, we want to photograph your car. And that call came. Speed and sound phone, they did a shoot, and we got a double feature with them. And from there I got called out to a car show in Cape Town and we won the super custom car and the overall custom car of the show where there were many amazing cars. And I thought, wow, this was a great story. But I didn't actually know where it was leading to. Then I actually said to a friend of mine, you know what, I'd like to document this dream that I had that came into reality to possibly inspire somebody else out there to do their own razor build, whatever that may be. And then he said to me, yeah, but you know, you've got to do it with outside media houses and et cetera, et cetera. And I said, no, man. We've just built a car that everybody said to me will not shine on the world stage. I've had guys like Voss in the UK, Nismo, from all around the globe say to me, well done, brilliant. And I said, listen, you know what? I don't mind listening to advice. But I believe you've got to be confident in what you want to do. And I went and spoke to a local media house in Cape Town. We did a video, we did a trailer. From the trailer sparked the video called The Journey. What I did on the video was, because you see sometimes fame and greed, two bad combinations. You'll survive with it for a certain limited space in time, but you'll get to a point where you fail miserably. And what I did with this video was to make people around me stronger. That was something that my dad taught us in business. Is that the stronger the people around you are, the stronger you are by virtue of your placement. What happens in life is, and especially in today's day and age, we all want to grab and grab and grab. And we seldom want to give off. And that's human nature, where you first want to see to yourself. So we did this, this video where I showcased all the guys involved in the build. And there was something where their businesses, some of them have never been on an on international or even on a local platform to this level. And I was elated by the response that we got. Because it turned out to be probably one of South Africa's most viral car videos ever. We reached close on to 3 million people. And secondly, the video was viewed by more than 600,000 people. And anybody that knows Facebook knows that those incidental stats of somebody actually watching it and not clicking onto it, those are not counted. 
And I thought, hey, this was the culmination. This was, this was, I couldn't have expected more. And then I got another call. What had happened was, I was driving one day and a lady with an American accent phoned me. And I thought to myself, you know, I got quite a few friends out there, this is a prank call. And something said to me, stay on the phone, don't, don't throw, don't put it off. And she said she's from CNN. And I thought, no man. Um, can this be real? You know what I mean? The reality of it is, I would expect if I got caught for a crime, a news agency would be phoning me. But I never started this bill thinking, I'm going to have CNN phone. Gerard, if we can pull up to the folder on media, please. No, not that one, the media. Uh, let's see. Uh, build media. Thanks. So the CNN producer, if you can just put it on a loop, if you, if you can, on those photos. So the CNN producer said to me, why should we interview you? And those are the bold photos, those are the feature photos of the Speed and Sound magazine. And what had happened was, to complete the CNN side of my story, I, I answered Marion Edmonds in the typical Razik Raja way. That's my late mom and myself. And that's normally filled with a lot of bulldust. I said to her, firstly, you took the time to track me down. And I said to her, that means you got good taste. I said to her, the second thing is, the reason why, you're asking me why you should cover the story. I said to her, the outside world, 95% of them see South Africa with tires burning or marches. And I said to her, 95% of them, of those people, maybe 50% of them think we play with baboons in the morning and we play with tigers in the afternoon. And I said, sometimes just based on economies of scale, it doesn't mean that we don't have abilities. And what had happened was, the rest was history. I found myself being on a national, international news channel, um, showcasing a product produced or redefined in a third world country that is being admired currently on a world stage. I was asked by a talk show host, Faisal Sayed, who invited me to his show. He asked me where to from here. And that sometimes in your studies, you, you're going to complete your studies. And we sometimes have this road map and this perfect direction we believe that we want to go. And I guess everybody here has that dream of saying, I want to either live in the penthouse or I want to live on the fifth story. And that's great. But sometimes, as in this story that I'm relaying to you, don't let your inspiration or your aspiration limit what you can achieve. And why I say that is, when I was interviewed by CNN, when I was interviewed by Faisal Sayed, and he asked me a very apt question, where to from here? And I said to him, I don't have a plan. I said to him, but I've got passion. And what happens is that where 
I refer to you with regard to to keeping yourself grounded. Somebody will always find you more approachable if you are not looking into the sky. Because if you're grounded and your head is not in the sky, you can actually see the potholes that come along. So where to from here resulted in five, actually four, individuals approach me to redefine cause for them. So in six weeks from now, we have a Razor Evoke and we have a Razor R8 that will be hitting the platform within South Africa and to an expose to the outside world or to the outside countries. Six weeks there from, we have another two bills coming out, being a Razor Dodge and a Razor M3. And I thought, listen, this would be, this is an amazing thing. We had a Razor GTR, and I else from my name, Razik, I said, I want to do something that I can leave a legacy behind. And my wife says to me, every time you do something, you talk about leaving a legacy. How many legacies do you want to leave behind? And I laugh and I say, you know what? I've always been a dreamer in a real space. And I think that's important in life. Don't stop dreaming. Because the day you stop dreaming is the day you stop aspiring. And I thought to myself, hey, this is great. These four new bills coming out, my name is attached to it. What an amazing story. And I was on the grand run where they asked me to be the pace call. And I sat opposite the head of SABC3 on content, he's the head of content. And I said to him, Hammond, I would like to ask you a question. This is the traction I received on Razor GTR. You being the head of content of SABC3, you should be able to give me some sort of gauge how well we've done. I said, sometimes when you're talking to individuals and you ask them how well have we done, they might take it in the wrong ways if you want to put yourself on a platform to believe you are that great and wonderful. And when he looked at it, he said to me, my God, this is amazing. I've got TV shows that are not getting distraction. So he says, you know what, I'd love to actually get a custom car show, a South African custom car show. I need content like this. And at that time, one of the guys that are the leading producers in South Africa, is standing next door to me, and he says, that's exactly what I have been banging at your door about. See the traction. Advertisers want to advertise on something where there's traction, something that's new. So we've been fortunate enough to actually now say that we actually are part of, well at the moment it's the first, whether somebody else trumps us and comes out with another show, we will be coming out, be it on, a, on the traditional format of the SABC 3s or on the online format, we are busy with and in the process of creating the first South African car build show. So in summary from my side, my purpose of coming out here today is not to tell you I've studied at UWC. It's not to tell you that I decided to jump ship from Stellenbosch. It's not to tell you that I've done a lot of weird and wonderful things in my life. It's actually to tell you that we need more inspired people in South Africa. We've got a very negative communication system. Everything we see is negative. It has an effect on yourself. We're all human. You know, as you see in supermarkets, people 
spend lots of money with marketing companies to know what to place where. There's a reason why bread is at the end of the aisle. Because by the time you get to the end of the aisle, you would have taken something else. There's a reason why I have friends of mine that are in marketing with kids' toys. The amount of money that they spend on marketing the toy and with the movie, there's a reason behind it. It has an effect where you see it and you don't actually realize that you're being made accustomed to it. So what I'm saying to you, in South Africa, we've been made accustomed to a lot of negative reports. We see negative things about the government. We see negative things about society. And you know what happens sometimes? That negativity filters into you. And it comes out in everything else you do. And my sole purpose here today is to tell you that South Africa needs more inspired people. We unfortunately don't have the Hollywood here that everybody can dream I want to become some famous star. So, as South Africans, my wish to you is that I hope today I've inspired you in some small little way. In whatever field you choose to do, do it to the best of your ability. Do it that at the end of the, that at the, end of the day when you are done, that you are satisfied. Not that somebody else is satisfied. Because when you are satisfied, that's when you're doing your best. And open your mind to criticism. I will conclude on that. I always tell staff below me, and I'm going to close with this, I don't want to overstay my welcome. People get very upset when you criticize them. I take any criticism as positive criticism. When you do that, you see yourself from the other side of the mirror. And when you can turn that into something positive, you actually turn it into something great. So in closing from my side, all the best for the June exams, for the December exams. And I once again want to thank Gerard for calling me out here. I hope I didn't bore you too much. And uh, thank you very much for being a most attentive audience.